Welcome to our webinar series. Today we have our two special guests, Amy Krulitz from Equipment Zone, and we have Matthew Rome from Epson. And together they will be our guides as we navigate through our top 10 dye sublimation FAQs. These are the most frequently asked questions that we've been getting over the past 18 months to two years, centered specifically around dye sublimation. So if you have been slightly confused by sublimation or dye sublimation or dye sub, depending on what you want to call it, you're not alone. So if you're a screen printer, if you're an embroiderer, if you already are our client and own a DTG printer, you are at the right place at the right time with two great guests who are going to help us by answering these questions. So we put together the list of 10 questions and we're going to ask them and then answer them. And sometimes Amy will give us the answer and sometimes Matt will give us the answer and sometimes both of them will give you the answer. The good news is I'm just going to be your navigator. So you won't have to listen to me talk today. You get to listen to Amy and Matt. So Amy, Matt, welcome. How are you today? Fantastic. Excellent. Matt, how are you today? I'm great. <laughs> well, that's good. So the next thing we need to really rock and roll on are the questions. And so uh, let's just jump right into it. I'm going to advance the slide when you tell me to, Amy. Okay. But um, the first question that we get all the time is really about um, the fabric. And it is specifically, do my shirts need to be 100% polyester? Right. So yes, the answer is a short yes. Um, the best way to get the best process going with dye sublimation is with 100% polyester. Before Jay goes to the slide, I want to point behind me. If you see this backdrop behind me, this is actually uh, a table covering that I ordered and it is made with dye sublimation. So you can see how nice and bright the colors are and the fabric is a very nice soft polyester. So I thought you'd be interested in that little tidbit. So I think what we'll do is we'll go to the basics of what happens during dye sublimation and that will help you better understand why the shirt should be 100% polyester. So Jay, let's go to the slide. Next slide, please, said Amy. <laughs> okay, so if we review what happens during dye sublimation, it's a chemical process. So you're going to be printing your image on paper with, with special ink. Um, now, when you apply heat and pressure with the ink on that paper and your substrate, that ink will turn into a gas. The gas then permeates the fibers of the fabric. So those fibers as synthetic fibers are able to fully absorb the gas. That's how the color is transferred to the polyester fabric. If you have some cotton in there, it will still transfer to the polyester fibers, not the cotton fibers or the other non-polyester fibers. So it won't be as rich um, as it would be if it were 100% polyester. But some people do that specifically so they can get that distressed look on shirts. If you've seen those shirts where they actually start out looking washed out, yeah. You can do that with dye sublimation. Uh, the problem with that is the wearability. It may not last that long through a lot of washings because the, um, the fibers that are non-polyester really are not holding the, the color as well. But it is something that some people like to do purposely. So this is one of the reasons why you want polyester. If you're using a hard substrate, those hard substrates are coated with a polymer. And so that polymer also allows that um, science to happen with the gas and with permeating that polymer coating. That's why polyester and polymers are so important in dye sublimation. Matt, anything to add as we talk about the process, as we talk about heat and pressure and color and polyester? Well Yes, I get this question all the time. People want to print on 100% cotton with polyester and that's just not, it can't happen, okay? Because of the way that the process works. So when you're wanting to uh, dye sublimate, remember polyester is king. Well said, well said. 
Okay, let's move to question two, Amy. Okay, question this two. Is a question that I get asked. So I'm sorry, Jay. Did you want to say the question? No, e either way, it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so the question is, can I use colored shirts? So the answer is, you can transfer to a colored shirt, but remember that whatever color that shirt is, it's going to affect the outcome. So let's just say, for instance, you have a pale yellow shirt, and you want to transfer onto that. Well, whatever color your image is, is going to also add yellow to it. So if you've got blue in your image, well, after you're done transferring, now you're gonna have green because blue and yellow equals green. So you have to be um, aware of the difference that the color is going to make in the background of that shirt. Some people do it purposely, they get nice results with that, and there's no reason you can't. But just remember, you won't get the same exact color you're after. Well said, thank you, Amy. Matt, anything to add to that answer, that question? Yeah, I get a lot of people, they'll, they'll ask me, they go, well, you know, you can dye sublimate onto black shirts, right? And I go, no, absolutely not. They go, well, we see this all the time. We get shirts that are dye sublimated and they're black and What's hard to wrap a lot of people's head around is that they're sublimating the whole entire shirt. So they take a, a white shirt and they use a huge heat press and they dye sublimate the whole entire shirt and they change the entire color of that shirt. Or like if you look at Amy's backdrop, that started out, believe it or not, as just white fabric. Right. right. And they sublimated the whole fabric and turned it color. Right. So that's one of the, the great things with dye sublimation is that you can do that. So it sounds like what you're both saying is you start with the, the, the blank canvas is white material in this case. It might be a, a, a shirt or, or a jersey or a tote bag that's already constructed and made, or it could be big bolts of fabric. Is that yes. right? Yes. That's correct. And just to add to that, if you've ever visited our booth at any of our trade shows, we very often do what's called all over dye sublimation. We take baby shirts because they're small enough to fit on a 16 by 20 heat press. And we do make an oversized print. First we do the front and then we do the back of it. And if you design your garment right, you will get wonderful results. And the reason I say that is because if you're working with shirts that are already been manufactured and sewn, mm -hmm. you're going to get wrinkles because it's not completely flat. So if you design something with white space in the right places, like under the arms, or you make a design where around the neck, there's a lot of white space, you will get fantastic results by doing an all over. Excellent. Well, let's keep moving along. Thank you. We've got some great chats going on. By the way, let me pause for just a minute. For those of you that are commenting in the chat section, thank you. We may not be able to address your exact question in the moment, but what we would also love it if you would please is to go to the Q&A section where it actually says Q&A or question and answer. Those, those get recorded and I'll make sure to copy and save those and send them to Amy. That way she has a way to email you after the fact if we don't answer the question in this session. So thank you. Sorry for that uh, temporary commercial that, that was brought to you by Equipment Zone. <laughs> okay, what's our next question? Isn't it something to do with desktop printers? Can't I, can't I use any desktop printer, Amy, Matt? <laughs> All right, and somebody, answer. And somebody gonna, asked about that. Somebody Matt's asked about that. They already that. did. I'm going to answer this. Okay. And Jay, you can probably go to the next slide at some point. There we <laughs> there go. There we go. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna answer that question that I'm gonna let Amy talk about the slide. So here's the thing. For a lot of years, Epson did not manufacture die sub printers. And what uh, some people did was they would hack our desktop printers. So they would take a Epson desktop printer that was made to print paper and they would dump various third party inks into it. Now, did it work? Yeah, it did work. But after a while, what would happen is because that printer was not made for die sub and it was someone else's ink, eventually what would happen is the print heads would clog. 
and it would get to such a point where you would just throw away the whole printer. Okay. Now, uh, back in, uh, when was it? It's been about six years ago, Epson decided to come out with uh, die sub equipment. And this is our own print heads and our own ink. So it's a match set. And when you have a match set of print head and ink, you're going to get far better results. You're going to get better print quality. You're going to get... Uh, durability on the print head. It's going to last longer. You're not going to have clogs and things like that. So to answer the question, yes, you can put dye sublimation in a ink in a bunch of different printers. Will they work? Probably, but are they going to last and are your prints going to look good? No, probably not. There are so many YouTube videos. <laughs> when you go Google die sub, that's the first thing that comes it's, up. A, it's very, very a, sad. A sea of, of, of do-it-yourself people trying to take ink from some other source and, and force it down a, a variety of printers. They typically go with the cheapest printer possible. I love what you said, Matt, about a match set. That makes so much sense to me. Yeah, and one of the um, one of the conversations I have very regularly with with customers, they tell me that you know they buy an inexpensive Epson printer, which is about you know seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, and by the time they use it and they the print head doesn't last because of the inks, they throw it away and they buy another one. And I say, okay, well, how many are you doing? You buying in a year? And sometimes they're buying three printers in a year. Uh, they're using the printers as disposable items. And then I say, well, you know, for almost the same amount of money, you can get the Epson Shore Color F570, which is the one you see on the left there. It's a desktop printer. You won't have to throw that away. And you get to keep it for years because you've got the right print head, the right ink, and the right paper. Everything is going to work in concert. So it really makes more sense to look at a printer, a piece of equipment that you're gonna to wanna to have for some years to come, as opposed to looking at it as something disposable. Um, I will tell you from my experience with, with Epson for many, many years, I've sold many of those desktop and photographic printers uh, that people are started to use for dye sublimation. Those printers are designed to print photos. Uh, they're designed for amateur photographers and some professional photographers who want to print beautiful photos. The print head is designed for different ink going through there. So when I tell you that they will get destroyed, uh, they will get destroyed. So this slide shows how Epson came out with a full family of printers for everyone's uh, budget. You know, the 570 is, is the perfect desktop printer. It's got the print head, the ink and the paper all matched full turnkey and it's very affordable. It's, it's you know, $26.95. Um, the three on the bottom are for heavy production use. They're 64 inch wide and they're used for different reasons. And then the one on the upper right is, is my favorite. That's the 6370. That can be used for anything from beginners to advanced people because it's, it's a great printer. It's 44 inches wide and the color is fantastic. Well said, you, know, you guys. Well said. Something else, too, Amy, that yeah. people don't realize is one of the great advantages of the Epson 570 for a lot of people that are just starting out in this business, Epson doesn't penalize you for being a small user. A lot of these third-party inks, they're selling cartridges for our printers that are two, three, four hundred dollars $400 for a small cartridge. The ink cartridge for the Epson 570 is $17. So, <laughs> no, I, Matt, I got to tell you, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I had to look it's, three times to make sure that was not a mistake. I'm not exaggerating. Yes. So we don't penalize a small user like other people do. Uh, I have seen ink cartridges, much smaller capacity that are over a hundred dollars yeah. for, for a desktop starting system. So, uh, I like what Amy has said in past webinars where she has explained that this is a great entry level, um, you know, but, but she and I both have kind of our eye on the 6000 series because of its increased capacity. So, 
both are awesome. I, you know, I, I, if I were starting out today, those would be the two that I would be looking at. Like, how serious am I and how much production am I going to really do? Maybe one would probably lead me to the other. All right, Amy, back to you. We All answered right. that question, and I know that some, someone somewhere at one point has probably asked you about software. Do you ever get a, is that a frequently asked question, Amy? Yes, everyone wants to know, well, do I need special software to do this? So I will tell you that the Epson printers come with software. Now, Matt may want to speak a little bit about the software, but I'll talk a little bit about what RIP software is. There are two ways you can print to a printer. One is through a driver, which is basically a, a mini program that tells the printer what to do. And another is through a RIP software, which basically stands for raster image processor, um, not that exciting. But what it does is it tells the printer more instructions, not only about what to print and how to print, but how to make the color look. And color is very important in dye sublimation because you can't tell the results until you've done the pressing. And it's so important that you get the color right. So using a RIP software is great because there are what we would call profiles, which basically are recipes. The profile is a recipe that tells the printer how to lay down that color and how much of each color to do for the particular substrate you're pressing to. And having RIP software really comes in handy for that reason. So the Epson printers that you see here, uh, with the exception of the 570, do come with a RIP software called Epson Edge. And Matt, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Well, what Epson Edge is, is it's a software that was uh, developed by Epson for our printers. Uh, you get that for free with uh, the six, seven, and nine series printers. Now with the 570, you get a, uh, a driver uh, for that printer. One of the nice things is too about Epson is we have a lot of relationships with a lot of other software vendors too. So just because you get Epson Edge for free with the printer, you still can use most available um, other rips that are on the market, for example, like Wasatch. Uh, if you want, if you already have your whole workflow solution with Wasatch, more than likely you can plug one of these printers in and it'll work just as well with your other RIP. The other software that we really love because we have it in our showroom uh, is Onyx. Mm -hmm. um, Onyx RIPs are used in every part of the industry. And in our showroom, we have the same Onyx RIP running Epson photo printers, Epson solvent printers, and Epson dye sublimation printers all at the same time. So another reason for a RIP is for productivity when you have multiple pieces of equipment and you want to control the jobs going to each particular printer. So there are a lot of great features that RIPs offer you. Excellent answers, both of you. Thank you. And I know it's, it can seem confusing, but these are the questions that people ask us all the time. And for any of these answers, if you're looking for a deeper level please reach out to Amy and we can follow up and figure out a way to get you some specifics, examples, and, and, and even pricing. But uh, how, how great is it that it completes the match, as Matt was talking about earlier, that you have something that has been built from the ground up with a purpose. So the way the printer is made, the way the inks are manufactured, the printhead itself, and even the software, it just com completes the set, if that makes sense. All right, Amy, guess what? I know what the next question is. <laughs> and I know a little something about it, but I'm not even going to speak like you to it. About it. No, 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 no. I am, I am just here to guide the process. You two are the experts. <laughs> um, but I know that the question has to do about artwork, and we hear that a lot. Where do I go, or how do I manage the process, or where do I get great artwork? What can you tell us? Well, the first thing I'll tell you is that if you're brand new in this and you're not a designer yourself, you can go to Great Dane and you can find it online, Great Dane Graphics, and you can get ready to use graphics for dye sublimation. He has catalogs and catalogs of, of images ready to print. So that's one way you can get started. Um, the other thing that's important is working with uh, the Adobe products. Um, you wanna be able to 
design. Um, you can design in other product groups as well, but, but I think the Adobe product line is going to give you flexibility to do really complex images. And dye sublimation images are very complex. If you look at the one behind me, that's a very complex image that was designed. It started in Illustrator more than likely, and there were all kinds of layers used. Um, and by the time it got through to the rip, it was quite a complicated file. But because you were using the, they were using the Adobe products, it really simplified it. You do want to have a high resolution image. And like everyone talks about, even in direct to garment webinars, 300 DPI at the final size is always your best bet. Can you get away with a lower resolution? You can because fabric has a bleed to it and the bleed sometimes takes the place of, you know, it fills in the area where you may not have the best resolution. But if you're transferring onto hard substrates like metals and coasters and mugs, you really want to have the right resolution. Makes a lot of sense. Matt, anything to add? No, that's great advice. I use Great Dane Graphics for quite a few things. The beauty of, of their uh, artwork is that it's very high detailed. And when you're printing digitally, why not use it to your advantage? So it is a very, very good artwork. GreatDaneGraphics.com is part of the Stalls family. So if you have any questions about that, we could guide you to their website. Um, we're we're we don't get anything for saying that we're not in, we're endorsing it because we all like it. It's, it's a genuine endorsement. It's just, you know, a fact, uh, there, there are others that are going to lead you maybe towards graphic, uh, collections that are vector based that still print well, but remember the difference between a vector and a bitmap. Um, and to Matt's point, if you can use full spectrum digital, why wouldn't you? So yes. I think also we should speak maybe just briefly to the fact that Google Images is probably not your best starting point or source point for graphics. Number one, you probably won't be the author or owner and will be potentially violating some copyright issues. So just because you can see it on the internet does not mean it belongs to you and you can print it. So I would be aware of that and be, uh, be a little smart be smarter about going to Google Images and borrowing somebody else's artwork. And one last thing, uh, if you go to our website, our store, you'll be able to find a book that Dane has written on how to use Photoshop. And it will teach you step by step how to make images for direct to garment and dye sublimation. It's a great book. Yeah, and excellent point. $99. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah, and under $100 for real. Yep. It's great. Okay, takes us to our next question. Right. So artwork, I'm sure we could have spent an hour on that, but we have to move forward. We have other questions specifically about the heating element, the heat source or heat presses. Amy, you get a few questions about that. We did a whole webinar dedicated to that, but maybe you could answer the question, what do I need to know about heat presses? Okay, so yeah, we did a webinar on heat presses a couple of weeks ago, and it, it is on our website. Um, the thing about heat press for dye sublimation it's very different than direct to garment. And I know a lot of people start with direct to garment and they add dye sublimation as an additional offering. So the first thing they say is, well, why can't I use my clamshell pop-up heat press for dye sublimation? And, you know, I'm not going to say you can't. I don't like that phrase, you can't. You can do anything you want. The question is how successful and how easy will it be? Here's what happens. When you do dye sublimation, you're making a sandwich. So you're taking a piece of paper on the bottom of your platen to protect it. Then you're putting your substrate, whether it's a shirt, piece of fabric, or a hard substrate. Then you're taking your dye sublimation paper that came off your printer, and you're turning it face down into that substrate. Then you're putting another piece of paper, they call that blowback paper, to absorb any of the steam that comes up during the pressing. Well, when you've got all of that done, what happens when the heat press is finished with a pop-up? It pops up. When it pops up, things can move. Jay, you want to go to that slide? Yes, things often move. And when you, refer, often to, move. When you refer to a pop-up, I think we often sometimes also call it a clamshell. That, that. A clamshell with the pop-up yep. on it, right. So if you look at these images, you'll see what can happen when things move. This is called ghosting. 
Now, when you are pressing something that's been uh, sublimated, and remember what we talked about earlier, that ink is turning into a gas. So gas does this. Now, if that paper is not flat on your substrate and it moves, that gas is gonna continue. And this is how ghosting occurs. And you can see the different outlines that you'll get. And so many of us have gotten this, even with non-pop-ups. <laughs> You've gotta be careful to make sure that you don't get a lot of movement. So when, when you ask, you know, I already have a heat press for my DTG printer, do I need another one? If you wanna do it right, you really do. They're, they're well priced. We sell the Geonite heat presses. You can get a 16 by 20 swing away heat press. You know, it's $1,500, it's a great investment, and it's gonna give you really super, super results. The other thing I would suggest is you make sure you use heat resistant tape. That heat resistant tape is gonna keep things nice and flat and firm when you're doing your, your transfer. Excellent. I think you answered that question. Matthew, anything to answer or add? Yes. So the most important uh, part of dye sublimation is to make sure that you have proper pressure and heat. That makes things so much better. And to ensure you have the proper pressure and heat is you need a good heat press. Like Amy said, if you're going to do dye sublimation, purchase another heat press. And by the way, folks, don't go on eBay and search around and try to find the cheapest heat press available. That's not going to work. A lot of cheap heat presses don't have enough what they call winding coils inside. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't get even heat throughout the heated platen you'll get cold spots so your images don't transfer correctly. Make sure that you do purchase a good heat press and Amy can help you out with that. And just as, a, just as an aside, Jay, when are we doing the um, troubleshooting webinar? We're doing one for troubleshooting dye sublimation. And we're gonna we, talk about all kinds of problems that come up during dye sublimation. And how do correct, we yes, thank you Amy. We haven't scheduled the date yet, but it will definitely be in May. So probably in the next 10 days to two weeks, uh, pay attention to our website, please visit often, come back like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and you'll be definitely able to follow and see that upcoming webinar. So pay attention, watch, watch for those dates soon. Um, well, heat presses are important. Ghosting is important. I've experienced both. Um, you just want great results, bottom line. So why shortcut the system, right? Okay, so what is our next question, Amy? Are we gonna talk a little bit about cut and sew? And it has come up already in the chat. Good, People wanna know good. more about that. What is that? How do I manage that process? Maybe you could share some light, share some insights. Okay, so um, cut and sew is, is a, a term that's used for people who wanna manufacture um, products that are gonna be turned into garments or uh, banners or tablecloths or shower curtains, anything that, that clearly needs to be sewn. Uh, I think we've got a slide on that one, Jay. I hope so. <laughs> okay. So here are some examples of what would be cut and sew. Uh, if you look at the printer on the upper left, the 6370, and the one on the upper right, the 9470H, which by the way has fluorescent inks in it, so the images will look fabulous. Um, they are printing out pattern pieces. They're already done and they're done through pattern software and um, which you can uh, get. You can get patterns already for dye sublimation and I can give you that information offline if you like. So that's gonna go through your printer. Now, what you can do is you can go to um, a, a cutting table or a laser cutter, which is also used. So you're gonna print out these pattern pieces then you go to a laser cutter, which will automatically, tra you'll transfer this to your fabric, then the fabric goes on this laser cutter, automatically cuts, and then it goes right to the seamstress. So that's one way to do cut and sew, and that's what they mean by that. Second way is if you look at the two printers in the center. These are designed for people who wanna make bolts of fabric. So bolts of fabric are for 
again, interior design work, banners, signs, clothing. So with these two printers, you would go to what's called a calendar heat press. And you would take a bolt of white polyester and you would mount it on the back of this calendar heat press, which essentially looks like a printing press. And you would web it with this roll of paper now that's come off your printer. And you're gonna web it together. And when that calendar heat press is finished, you will be left with what looks like on the right, a bolt of already printed fabric now that can be used for tracing and putting patterns down on it for sewing. So there were really two different ways to uh, approach cut and sew. One with the pattern already in place and one by making a bolt of fabric. I love that explanation. That was perfect. Matthew, anything to add? No, that was so great that I have nothing to add. Abs absolutely hard to believe that I'm wow. speechless. That is hard to you know, I'm going to have to get my sewing machine out now. It's in, <laughs> in my closet. It's been there for years. I think it's so, time to start sewing. <laughs> I think, you know, you, you just to, to make the point and to be timely, um, there are a lot of people who are using two and three layers of sublimated products and are making original and custom face masks right now. Yeah. So um, for those of us that are, are aware and tuned in to the situation, mm -hmm. face masks will become our new accessory. I think they'll be um, the new hat for the rest of the year as we'll see people coordinating. They'll right. coordinate them with, their, with the fashion statements. Um, I know that seems a little new to many of us here in the United States, but the reality is this has been a fashion statement in the, in the uh, Southeast Asia for a long time. Um, so uh, whether, whether you do a sublimation process or not, I've just started to see a whole bunch of those. So pay, pay attention and look for opportunities that might be yours. And just as an aside again, I wanna point back to here. Let me see if I can, I can show it to you here. See the back of it? So we know it's dye sublimation. Now, I don't know if you can actually see this, but this was a 52 by 70 inch tablecloth. That means it was done on a bolt of fabric and then it was cut afterwards. So they probably made this on a calendar heat press. Then based on the way these edges are scalloped, my best guess is they used a laser to cut it out and finished it that way because it's, it's almost, it's got little holes in it. It's really very nicely finished. And this is an example of how a calendar heat press, um, even though this wasn't sewn one piece, but it still falls under that category. Yeah, I've seen a lot of throw pillows and throw yeah. blankets that are coordinated and matched, probably done the same way, right? Uh -huh. Definitely. Awesome. Okay, so Amy, an important question we get a lot is the longevity and how long will something last? How long does dye sublimation last? Right. Well, if you remember again, back to the original slide, we're dyeing, we're dyeing fabric. So now we're not laying ink on top of fabric. So we don't have to worry about it coming off in the wash. Basically, if you are um, doing fabric or shirts, it's gonna last as long as that fabric lasts, provided you transferred it properly with the proper heat, the proper temperature, the proper pressure. You still have to start out with a very well-pressed piece of fabric. And once again, you're going to hear heat press is the key to good dye sublimation. So if you are really pressing properly and you get a good final product, that fabric is going to last as long as those fibers hold up. Now, if you're working with hard substrates, that's a little bit of a different story. I think we have a slide on that. We do indeed. So, <laughs> so we're going to talk about Chromalux. Uh, Chromalux is, is one of my favorite hard substrates. Chromalux makes all kinds of, of substrates, metal, um, um, fi fiberboard, wood, everything. And all of these are coated with polymer, which make them ready for dye sublimation. In the case of these metal prints, I'm going to talk a little about Wilhelm. So Wilhelm uh, research is uh, was formed, I, I can't even remember what year, someone will correct me. I think it was formed in the late 60s, maybe the 70s. And what this, this gentleman did is he figured out a way to determine how long products will last. 
And he figured out that if he put it under certain lighting conditions, he could actually um, simulate years. And that's how he would test. Well, he became the de facto standard in archivability. And everyone in any of the photographic industries always refers to the Wilhelm testing. Uh, you can go to the website and find out more about that's fascinating. So based on the Wilhelm, based on the Wilhelm, thank you, um, okay. So Henry Wilhelm, he was born in 1856. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're <getting> some help. <laughs> Love Very that. funny. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> anyway, so based on Chromalux, it's been tested for 65 years. They talk about a print permanence rating, and that's called um, for indoor fate. And what does that mean? Well, you know, you've got UV light everywhere, and UV light does affect things. So for indoor galleries and artwork, 65 years is a good long time. What they do say is that it translates to 100 years in reality, normal lighting conditions. So if someone is doing metal for indoor photography, and that's becoming very big now, dye sublimation photography, you can be sure that if you're selling a photograph on metal for five, six, eight hundred dollars to someone or to a corporation to hang in their executive offices. It's going to last a long time under normal lighting conditions. Well said. You are a resource at deep information on the Wilhelm testing and the permanence of <laughs> well, you know, it started archivability. <laughs> Years ago, it was all the rage because when we were selling Epson photographic printers for commercial proofing and commercial work, it was very important. You know, fade was a big issue. Good and enough. that's how he would test different manufacturers' inks. And he held a lot of power in the, um, in the industry. If he tested inks and those inks faded, that company was in big trouble in the marketplace. So it's important. Well, it's an important issue. Obviously it is. And, and I think a lot of us look through the lens of apparel and, and we're, we're looking for that washed fast proof, you know, beyond 20 washes, beyond 50 washes. And it's, right. it's one of the strengths of sublimation is that once you've paired that and completed the process correctly on apparel, it really is going to outlast the garment itself. You'll wear through the garment before you'll ever see that you know, that original print um, start to it fade. Stay vibrant. Very nice. Matthew, anything to add to the archival or the permanence rating for our uh, die sub? Yes, I would like to say that, you know, Epson, we don't manufacture substrates. Okay. We make the printer, we make the ink. Uh, so one of the things that you should do before you're pressing onto anything is to make sure you read the manufacturer's recommended instructions on how to press. Sometimes they'll have different tips uh, and tricks on how to get the best image on their product. So make sure you take the time before you, you just start pressing away that you read that instructions and understand. Excellent point. That's a great reminder. Well, Amy, I think we've got uh, two more questions, if I'm not, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. We've wrapped go. up our first eight. And just a quick reminder for those of you that have um, mentioned anything in the chat, we may not be able to hit your specific questions. We'll try to leave a little time at the end so that we can go to, a, to one or two. Uh, if you use the Q&A portion, if you can find that on your dashboard where it actually says question and answer, those are permanent. That's a report I can download. And, and if we don't get to your answers, uh, we will definitely have Amy follow up with an email. So uh, we're rounding the corner here to question number nine, and it has specifically to do with ink and paper costs. We, we get this question probably almost in every conversation. Well, how much does the ink cost? How much do the paper cost? And what I think people are really asking Amy is, is it profitable? Right. Because it really, it really comes down to, it doesn't matter what it costs is, can the market sustain this and will I be profitable? But I'd love to hear your take on that. Well, the, um, what's nice about the software that we were talking about before, the Epson Edge software, is that it has a cost estimator in it. And most RIP softwares will. So you can know right then how much ink and how much paper and what the cost of that is uh, when you're making something. 
uh, we had a we had an event here last year. We did a little Christmas in what was that? Christmas in October. It was yeah. <laughs> we did Christmas in October, where we were doing uh, all dye sublimation products. And this slide is actually from that presentation. I wanted to share that with you, because you're going to see now. This is based on the Epson 6370 printer, where the ink is very very inexpensive. And understand also the paper, the Epson dye sublimation paper, you know, that's in the, the 11, 10 and 11 cent per square foot range. So a lot of you are buying paper um, for your small desktops and you're buying by the sheet and you're paying a dollar a sheet. Start to think about that a little bit because the uh, paper costs are very high. Here you can see what it's gonna cost you. And this again is based on the Epson 6370 with Epson paper, Epson ink. But if you take something like that fleece blanket, the 30 by 40 fleece blanket, it costs $8 in paper, um, in materials, I'm sorry, $8 in material for that fabric, whatever that fleece fabric costs. But look at the printing cost, 91 cents. That's ink and paper combined. So under a dollar in, in your supplies, uh, if it costs you $9 to make this and you can sell it for $39.95, you're making a 77% profit on that. That's, that's good profit. Some of the other items you can see, the canvas tote. The canvas tote costs you very little, uh, 30 cents for ink and paper. And now look how much money you can make on that, 90%. And even though they say cotton canvas tote, it's not it's not a cotton product. It's no. just that's a descriptor that a lot of people use for that size and that mm -hmm. that kind of tote bag. It's a polyester right. tote bag. Socks. I've talked about socks so many times because it's just a great item. They're easy to make, they're they're inexpensive, and they're fun, and people love them. So you can make a great profit. You can see that. $17. Uh, you can make an 88% profit on sock making. So these are some of the ways that you can actually make money using dye sublimation. Matt, do you want to add to that? No, it's very true. The thing about dye sublimation is it's very inexpensive for your printing cost. And there's such a wide variety of different substrates that you can print on uh, you know, it, it is, it's just, it's just a great, uh, I hate this word. It's a great profit center. Okay. <laughs> Why do you hate the word profit? Come on, Matt. <laughs> so, you know what? I could totally see, I, I, I believe in the power of personalization from a marketing standpoint. That's one of my favorite reasons to consider sublimation is the ability to make one of something and, and personalize it. So I could totally see Matt Rome cruising around in those slippers with, with a pair of socks and a fleece throw over him, you know, with a warm cup of coffee every morning, it says Epson and Epson, and it's in the perfect Epson blue. I could totally see that. Can't you see that, Amy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're all wearing our fuzzy socks now anyway. <laughs> no one can see them, but we're wearing them. <laughs> uh, the reality is if you want to get some very specific information like uh, material costs, like ink costs, those variables depend and they have um, uh, it's something that Amy could help you with specifically for each printer. So please coordinate with her and she'd be happy to, to dial that in a little bit more specific for you. But I think it's really important to see um, the opportunity and the potential of the profit. So that's, what we, that's why we really wanted to show you this slide. Which brings us to our final question. We have done well. We are at the 1045 point here in Arizona, which means it's 145 in New Jersey. Um, Amy, we're on our last question. And our last question, I, I don't know. I'm wondering if this is if this is really something that you kind of snuck in there. But the question is, what's the best way to buy a printer? Now, before you say from me, because we already know that, and by me, I mean you, um, I think what people ask us is in terms of, are they looking for a way like, like credit card, cash, leasing? What are the options? Well, of course, you know, it all depends upon the price of the package. And once again, I'm going to go back to heat press. Um, you know, the Epson dye sublimation printers range in price, and they're all completely affordable, you know, starting at uh, the $26.95 all the way up. 
depending upon what your needs are, but it's the heat press that really determines what that system is going to cost you. If you're talking about a calendar heat press, you can be in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. In which case, we have numerous uh, leasing companies that we work with, and we'd be happy to connect you with them. And they can talk to you more about how you can do this and make your payments affordable. If you're talking about the lower priced heat presses that might be in the $1,500 range, and you're talking about a purchase that, you know, maybe under $10,000, uh, we also have different uh, plans for that, uh, whether you want to pay by credit card or also go with a, with a small lease. There are numerous ways we can do that, and we'd be happy to work with you on that. But once again, I would need to sit down and talk with you a little bit more about what size heat press you're really looking for. So I urge you, if you are interested, take a look at our heat press webinar that is on our website. It really outlines all the different heat presses and what they're for and what their sizes are. Amy, if I could jump in, I just want to brag on you for a minute. Um, because of your abilities, because of your um, experience, you have, you have definitely impressed me as the type of person in business development and sales who is more interested in the success of the customer than just making a sale. And so I think it's really a tribute to our entire sales team that we want to make sure that this is a great fit for you. This is the whole purpose of this webinar is to give you some information to help you make a great decision so that your business is strong and healthy. And I know that Amy's got answers beyond what we gave today, much deeper, much more detailed. This was just the start. So reach out to Amy. She's not interested in selling you something. She's interested in finding a match that makes sense to help you build your business. So that's just me bragging about you, Amy. I hope you won't be too upset with that. But I will say that, you know, we've got a great backbone here at Equipment Zone. The salespeople are consultants. We have a support group that literally waits for the phone to ring to help you. We have remote training where, you know, we spend five, six hours uh, with video cameras training you on how to do certain things. So we don't walk away after the sale. That's when the attention gets even more intense. So you will be happy that you, you got involved with Equipment Zone. Great point. Great point. So Matthew, anything to add there? There are a couple of questions. If we have time, I'd like to, I'd like to see if we could get one or sure. two of these out. Um, and, and I'm sure that you can answer one of these. The, uh, Kate asked, what's the biggest difference between DTG and sublimation? The biggest difference is DTG is primarily made for printing on cotton based products. Dye sublimation is primarily, well, it is made for printing on to polyester based products. That's the main difference. And it just depends on what type of business you're going to go into. I would recommend anybody that's going to go into DTG also buy a 570 Epson printer. Okay. That's one of the models. Uh, and that way you're gonna have a complete business. If you have Diasub and T DTG, there's not much that you're not gonna be able to decorate. Uh, well, we would 100% agree with you, Matt, uh, on that suggestion of a tandem purchase of an entry-level dye sublimation printer with your DTG direct-to-garment printer. So, of course, that makes a ton of sense for us. Um, it's interesting to me how so many people try so hard to make the one print on a substrate that it wasn't intended for or vice versa. So they, they get into sublimation and then they say, well, I want this to print on cotton. Or they get into DTG printing and they say, well, can't I print on poly? And it's like, you know, these two things, they're like cousins and they support each other very well. Um, but they were intended to do one thing really well. So pay attention to that. And I think that you answered that perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, maybe you can answer this next question. It came in from an anonymous attendee. Ooh, the mystery. They've right. asked specifically about Epson inks and are they approved by Chromalux? Oh, yeah, that's a very good point. So um, the, that Wilhelm testing that I was referring to, um, that is based on a combination of the Epson disublimation inks on the Chromalux. So those reports are specific to an ink manufacturer. And absolutely, the Chromalux products um, do beautifully with the Epson uh, dye sublimation inks. 
And if someone wants to get super nerdy with the inks, they can reach out to you and you've probably got manufacturing sheets and you've got all yeah. kinds of info. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. I, I will say though that they are approved for the OE techs. And if, if those of you are not familiar with that, basically, yeah, I, I say it in a kind of a crude way, but that means that if you make a baby shirt, dye sublimation, that baby can lick that shirt without any harm mm -hmm. coming to them. That's very <laughs> that's, important. That's not crude. I've had you babies. Know, babies they, lick they everything. put everything in their mouth. <laughs> they put everything in their mouth. That's and right. that's very important. If you're looking at dye sublimation ink, you want to make sure that it is approved. Yeah. So uh, let's um, let's get to our last question, and I think because it covers both, and, and since we we've, we've talked a lot about um, processes, but let's talk about customers. Customers want what they want, and a lot of times they'll ask for something that's right in the middle. And so this last question is, what do I do when a client says, or the product that they're about to print on is a 50-50 blend? So can I sublimate that or can I DTG print that? Or how would you guys suggest that we manage that issue? Matt, I'm going to go to you first. Oh, you bet Matt's going to answer that. <laughs> of course I am. <laughs> you're going to use your DTG printer and you're going to print the 50-50. Okay, DTG works very well on 50-50 because it is a woven garment. Also, DTG works very good on tri-blends, okay? So use DTG. Now dye sub doesn't work that well on a 50-50 because uh, it won't attach to the uh, cotton fibers in it. But on the other hand, DTG works very well for 50-50 and tri-blends and of course 100% cotton. And for more information and greater detail, you could go back to our website and watch previously recorded webinars where we, during our fact and fiction series, we've addressed that question on a number of times with a little bit more detail. Um, it is possible, it does work. It may require you to slow down your production and include a few more steps, um, but, but it, does, it does work well. And the DTG product will last. It is a permanent process. It's not gonna wash off in 10, 15, 20 washes. If, it's, if everything's done well and everything's done properly, you're gonna have a wash test and, and a washability and a longevity that equals any other process and is permanent. So, well, any, anything else to, uh, to add before we say goodbye to our, uh, to our uh, listeners, our watching? depending on what they're doing. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming and send me any questions you have. My email address is on the bottom there. And uh, check our website in the next couple of days when we uh, list the date for the next uh, dye sublimation webinar, which will be addressing all those troubleshooting issues. Excellent, excellent. Thank you both for your time. Um, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, uh, if anybody has any specific questions, they can reach out to Amy via email or call her. Um, again, please visit our website. Please visit Facebook and like us there. If you have um, products that you, you want to you know, talk about, Amy is definitely our subject matter expert for dye sublimation. And Matthew, it's been a privilege to have you join us today. Um, obviously, we're biased and we love the Epson products, but uh, the reality is it's the outcome for us. Um, once, you, once you see what is possible, um, that, that's truly what converted me. So. I'll say goodbye for now, and this webinar was recorded, but it will be available uh, tomorrow on our website. So that's all we have. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe.